I, with the, the format of, of this, this evening's proceedings is that we're going to be uh, introducing the subject, I guess, uh, talking a little bit here, throwing at about halfway through, throwing it open to the floor, and to our questions which are coming in uh, from the web, uh, which Ivan is in charge of. Uh, when we get there, there will be roving mics. But um, first of all, I, actually, Rebecca, I want to start with, um, with the question of China and how it works. People talk about the Great Firewall, which mm -hmm. of course is what stops material getting into China. But there is the whole internal censorship question, mm -hmm. uh, the question of how the citizens, and probably, probably what the government cares about more than what comes into China, is what the citizens themselves produce, what circulates, how they track it down, how they control it, what they choose to control, what they choose to negotiate or, or mediate or try and spin. So d I wondered if you could just give us a, a brief introduction to this very sure. complicated set of mechanisms. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people have heard about the Great Firewall of China uh, and, and what uh, many people tend to think about when they think about Chinese internet censorship is the way in which the Chinese government blocks overseas websites when you're trying to access the internet from within China. And this is actually what the Great Firewall of China looks like in action. Um, this is a screenshot taken uh, when attempting to access Human Rights Watch and you get an error message that uh, in, in uh, Internet Explorer looks like this, and Firefox looks a little bit different, but the same thing. It, it makes it look like basically your connection went down or you're having a technical problem. You don't get a message popping up saying, we're sorry, you're not allowed to visit that site according to the Chinese government. You just, you just get this failure, technical failure message, um, and, and you don't know why, really, and nobody's explaining. And, or anything. So, so this is, however, just one layer of internet censorship. And there, there was a lot of discussion of this layer over the Olympics because there was a lot of discussion about the fact that when uh, so many Western journalists went to China to cover the Olympics, they discovered they couldn't access any number of overseas websites and Many people complained, uh, you know, Voice of America complained, a lot of people complained saying, you know, China had promised to open up its internet and you know, stop censoring and yet it's still censoring. And so, so then quite a bit of the, the Great Firewall actually was loosened up uh, for a while during the Olympics. And then after the Olympics it was <coughs> tightened again. So there are now a lot of websites that could be accessed for a while but now are no longer accessible. But this is just one layer. This is just overseas websites. The process of censoring domestic internet content did not change throughout 2008. And if, if anything, over the Olympics increased uh, and has continued to increase over the past couple of months. And so I'd just like to give you a sense of what that looks again, because um, as Isabel pointed out, um, so this, this is search engine censorship, which is where basically companies that run search engines, be it Google or uh, Yahoo or, or Microsoft or various search engines, are, are asked to, um, to censor the results that appear on their Chinese services. And of course, Google got into quite a bit of, it came under quite a bit of criticism for, for deciding to do this. Uh, but, but here is, Google.com, and this is when you do a Google image search for Tiananmen Massacre in Chinese, uh, and, and then you get on Google.com, which is the international Google, um, quite a lot of gory pictures. If you do the same search on Google.cn, which is on, of the characters Tiananmen Massacre, you get some pictures of Tiananmen Square and parades, and you get some pictures of the Nanjing Massacre. Uh, but you don't get anything of the Tiananmen Massacre. So this is one way in, in which uh, companies, internet companies operating inside China are required to sanitize the content. Um, so it's not a matter, matter of, of, um, of, of, uh, of blocking directly. They, the, the search engines are basically uh, being expected to clean up what is appearing. Now, 
at Google.cn is actually quite a bit better than Baidu, which is the Chinese domestic search engine. Actually, Baidu has China's greatest market share for search engine. More Chinese people use Baidu than Google by quite a lot. Uh, and when you, when you search for Tiananmen Massacre on Baidu, you get nothing. And you get, you get an error message uh, saying, saying that, uh, that Baidu could not uh, find any results for Tiananmen Massacre. Uh, so, so that's one kind of, of internal censorship that you get with the search, just in terms of what people can actually find. But then, in terms of what people can actually put on the web at all, it's also controlled. So because a Chinese blogger, China has, we believe, 30 to 50 million bloggers, according to various statistics that have come out. Most of these people are not blogging on Blogspot or on WordPress.com or the international blogging platforms, because a lot of those platforms are blocked anyway by the Great Firewall. Most of these Chinese bloggers are blogging on Chinese domestic services. So they're, they're run by companies with names like Tencent or QQ and Sina and Sohu, Tianya, uh, and, and other companies that you probably haven't heard of. But these are all the big Chinese web companies that are hosting most of the blogging content that's happening in China and also all the chat rooms and forums. Um, and also most Chinese people who set up their own independent websites are doing it on Chinese web hosting companies. And all of these companies of, of different kinds are held legally responsible by the government, by the regulatory authorities, for making sure that their users are not posting things that are overly uh, politically sensitive. And so the onus is put on the private enterprises to keep overly sensitive content off the web. Not block it, keep it off the web. And so this is an example of um, one, one study I did where I was basically posting a lot of content across a, a, a series of different blog hosting services. And so I, I posted, I, I took an article about the Tiananmen mothers, which are, are the, the mothers of people who were killed in, in the Tiananmen crackdown, um, and, and pasted it into the Tianya blogging service. Uh, and this is the screenshot of the back end. This is where you, where you write your post before you, before you uh, publish it. And people who are in the audience who are bloggers, this would look familiar, except it's in Chinese. Um, this is what happens after I hit publish. It won't even let me publish the post. I get this error message that says, your post, Tiananmen Mothers Organization, publishes a website, has been successfully submitted. Because it contains sensitive words, please wait for the community editors to approve it. Please, please don't repost. Thank you. It never gets published. You know, it, it disappears into the ether. Um, and uh, a, another example is on Sina, a, another one of China's most popular blog hosting services. I succeeded in posting something about an explosion in Xinjiang. But uh, in less than 24 hours, it was gone. And so when I go to the same link, I get this error message um, saying, sorry, this does not exist anymore. Um, and I could go on a much greater length, but I won't bore you. Uh, but if you're interested in knowing more about how domestic content is removed by Chinese companies and my study on Chinese blog hosting censorship, um, the first Monday is a internet journal, and they're coming out with a, a research article that, that I'm publishing in there, and so you're welcome to look at that. So, so, so there is a vast system of just keeping content off the web. It's not 100% consistent and, and so on, but companies basically are expending a great deal of resources. And I, I know people who run web, who, who are web editors at, at some web companies who say that there are more people employed in the department that censors than the people <laughs> in the editorial department. Um, and, and, and this is being done by private employees, not the internet police, who we often hear about. And there are at every, this is, this is the website for the Shenzhen internet police, the Shenzhen division of the internet police. And, and you get this cute little character. And, and what's very interesting, though, is that the way the Chinese government explains this. There, it's, it's not like it's a big secret that this is going on. And, and when, if you read through the content on this site, they're like, we're protecting you from viruses. We're, we're protecting your kids from predators. Uh, we're, we're, we're protecting you from lies and from 
from you know nasty people who are going to expose your private information on the web when you go out on a date and you know you need us to help you and and there have been surveys done in China that show actually quite a lot of uh, you know a substantial number of respondents um, feel that the, the government should control the internet that the, they don't want a free for all and 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 that there should be some censorship so so that's very interesting um, that the government is is working to convince people that it's playing a positive role, that it's not just all a negative role, and some people um, do buy that. And there's also, and this is something that Evgeny's studying as well, and, and the, the Chinese government also recognizes that um, uh, censorship is not enough, and that you need to encourage and support people who are nationalistic and who support government positions. And so there are groups like this group who who created a, a site called Anti-CNN to, to trash CNN's China coverage. And one could go into a long story about how that evolved. CNN was, you know, CNN occasionally does make mistakes in its reporting. I, I worked for CNN for 12 years. I can tell you, you know, if you want to pick apart our reporting, there, there are plenty of things you can pick apart, just as with pretty much any news organization. And so uh, they, you know, they, they dig up all the errors in Western news coverage of China and expose it. And, and, you know, it's a site de devoted to the Western media conspiracy against China. This started um, with Tibet. And this started yeah. with Tibet last year. Um, and there were some specific incidents we, we yeah. can get into later, but uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing of Guinea, so I won't, won't, uh, won't hog too much time. But, uh, but again, that there, there <coughs> is a large, there, there's a large contingent of people in China who, who feel very patriotic, who feel offended when the West criticizes them, who feel that the Western media um, are not reporting China accurately. And, and their voices, you know, get a lot of support and do not get censored, while the other voices that are more critical do get censored. And, and so that kind of creates this, this kind of cycle of in, in terms of where the balance goes. Um, there are also paid commentators. They're, they're known as the 50 cent party because, at least in some cases, they're paid 50 cent, Chinese cents per post. Um, but, but, and, and this is oftentimes local governments, but, you know, Th this is really following a corporate model where a lot of companies pay people to go into web chat forums and, and blogs and say good things about products. And, and you know, there are political candidates here who, who do similar things um, politically. And so the Chinese government is employing the same technique, basically, um, trying to, to uh, influence public opinion. Whoops, I went a little fast. Um, at the same time, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, cynicism and criticism that does get through. Uh, and one thing that just happened uh, the other day is there was a big fire in Beijing, the building right next to the new Chinese Central Television building, which is this huge you know, feat of architecture that looks like this. Uh, the the residents of Beijing call it the underpants because they think it looks like <laughs> underpants. Um, but uh, the building right next to it went up in flames, and so the CCTV building seemed like it was on fire. And as, as I understand now, just from looking online today, a lot of the news about the fire has since been suppressed, partially because CCTV has been coming under a lot of criticism on the web lately, and people have been making fun of CCTV for its outdated, ham-fisted, kind of annoying programming, and have been like producing alternative online spoofs you know, of CCTV programming, and that had just all been going on, and then suddenly the CCTV building goes up in flames. It's kind of funny timing. And, and so you s <coughs> I was just online today, and some bloggers were collecting all the Photoshop jokes about the fire that have, are appearing on the Chinese Internet over the past few days, including this. Somebody took a, a, a poster of in Independence Day, the movie, and Photoshopped the, the CCTV fire, and there it says, the end of CCTV. Independence Day, you know, this is a joke. Um, you know, this this is a, a people are, are making a political statement there, and then you get other kind of silly statements like, you know, because the building is called the underpants, you know, this you know, don't worry, the underpants will save you. Kind of, you know, it it, it can't it my 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 underpants cannot catch fire. It says, um, I, I don't think the Chinese have the same uh, euphemism about pants on fire, but. Uh, uh, and, and this is even more cynical. Uh, the, the, for those of you who don't read Chinese, that says, ha, ha, ha. 
Um, and so a lot of this stuff has been appearing online just over the past 48 hours um, in, in very cynical fashion. Some of it being taken down, but you can still find a lot of it and, and it's appearing. So despite all the efforts at censorship, a lot of stuff is still coming out, particularly humor and spoofs and this kind of thing. I'm observing uh, that it's that kind of thing is having much more traction than the more serious kind of protest conversation. Uh, so it's sort of, sort of like you know Tina Fey's critiques, you know, go farther than than a serious one. And and just one final thing before we move on is a video that I just saw today. Um, that I will give you a, a, a little bit of background on. Uh, this is supposed to be a very innocent story about the alpaca sheep and uh, basically children sh singing about the wonders of the alpaca sheep. Well, it happens that the word for alpaca sheep in Chinese sounds the same if you change the character. It sounds the same as something one does to a person's mother. Um, and, and, you know, a very, you know, obscene thing. And, and so, so, so there's this viral video online protest has been going on, basically to protest the anti-smut campaign that the Chinese government has been using as an excuse to delete political material. Um, so there are all these different variations of this video, but this is the funny one, I've, the funniest one I've found so far. But if you if you go into the Chinese search engines and you search alpaca sheep, it's just wild what comes up. Um, and and this is kind of the the silliest. Um, let me just see here if we can. Well, <laughs> So, it's very silly, and it makes no sense at least you speak unless you speak Chinese, and if you speak Chinese, it, it's even worse, you know. Anyway, it's just, you know, it's, it's very naughty. It's very, very naughty. And, uh, and, and so this video is spreading all over the internet. Um, and 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 I guess you know just in conclusion, it, you know that you know, we, we've got this very funny situation where th there's no doubt that the government is is having a lot more success than anybody ever expected in controlling and manipulating the conversation and preventing people from accessing certain kinds of information or making it very difficult to have certain kinds of conversations. Yet we're seeing, particularly with the multimedia audiovisual just really in the last, I don't know, six months or something, that, that, that this kind of viral spoof, you know, video commentary uh, is, is gaining much larger traction. It's going to be very, very interesting to see where that goes and how the government manages to respond to it. Because so far they've managed to control the net well enough to prevent anything beyond localized protests from happening. Nobody's been able to organize a, an opposition party on the net or anything like that. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see where things go. I guess the humor is a special challenge. It's quite hard to lock people up for being funny, isn't it? That it is. And, and for singing about, for all you know, kinds of things. I, I mean, what charge singing do you stick on sheep. somebody who made a video about <laughs> alpaca sheep? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, there in China, we have this combination of, of manipulation, of control of uh, material that's coming in, of control of material mm -hmm. that originates. D does Russia follow the same pattern? Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. Russia censor the net in the same way? Well, Russia is unique in uh, two ways. I mean, first, it doesn't really censor the web. So, you know, we don't see as much censorship, if at all, as we see in China and many other Asian and Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern states. And the second part, which I think we have to realize about Russia, is that most of public life online happens on one particular platform, Live Journal. It's not uh, fragmented as it is in China, where you have many other blogs and blog platforms and forums and sites, which, in a sense, are harder to control, and you know, and you do need a more unified system to keep track of that. But in how, Russia, how, yeah. how can there really be one? Well, because of, uh, I guess, of some special nature of the Russian internet, all people who were into 
blogging and sort of cool web stuff around the year 2000, all decided to settle in one particular platform, which was an American company called uh, LiveJournal, uh, which was set up around 1990, I don't know. 1999, mostly for fun, you know. So it was mostly used before it came to Russia. It was mostly used by teenagers in California, you know, and teenage girls, and that was the sort of dominant audience. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, that's yeah, the dominant sure. uh, live journal audience outside of uh, outside <laughs> of uh, Russia, right? Uh, goth, you know, that culture. That's uh, sort of the typical live journal crowd. And somehow it went through the roof in Russia. Uh, so, uh, and gradually, of course, because of all the viral features uh, of the Russian internet, everyone wanted to be on LiveJournal because, you know, everyone else was. Right. So somehow in the, I think, critical years from 2003 to 2005, when, you know, the whole blogging phenomenon uh, began spreading around the world, everyone just went and registered an account on LiveJournal, right? Uh, so uniquely, uh, live journal now by 2009 is the platform where public life happens online. You know, so it's used for activism, it's used for mobilization, it's used for discussions, it's used for all sorts of cynical statements of the type that Rebecca has shown us, and it's present in Russia to the same degree. Uh, but I think what's important to realize, and you understand really how the Russian control works, is that live journal is no longer an American company. So, you know, first, the first very uh, troubling sign appeared around the year 2006 when an unknown Russian startup founded by a Russian oligarch very close to the Kremlin, Alexander Mamut, uh, basically bought the rights to service the Cyrillic segment of Life Journal. Basically, everything that was written in Cyrillic was supposed to be administered by this shady Russian company that just appeared a month ago. Right? And you know, many people got very concerned about that. You know, I also wrote a big story in this PhD and then argued that it doesn't look good. <laughs> and it only took a year and a half, I think, for Live Journal to be bought off in its entirety, including the uh, you know unneeded blocks of teenage girls in California and, <laughs> and elsewhere to be bought by this Russian company, essentially with you know Russian funding. So now um, it is a Russian entity. Uh, based in Moscow. I should also add that that's a money losing entity, that there is no money in this business, and they haven't figured out how to make money on it. So essentially, they are losing money. Uh, now it has, you know, of course, the, the key to understand about any blogging platform is that they have what's called an abuse team. And, you know, it sounds, uh, <laughs> I think, it is sort of very scary, but it's essentially people who decide what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to be posted online, right? So those are people who control uh, the web after stuff has been published. So it's they have some sort of a jury, you know, which decides what's good and what's not good, right? And of course, since the company became Russian, a lot of the members in that abuse team also became Russian, right? So they are much more uh, and much closely following now what's happening, as opposed to 10 years before when it was, you know, all run out of, you know, California and nobody was really paying attention to this bunch of Russians <laughs> doing something sure. weird on live journal. The point of uh, this being that it gives yeah. the government deniability, or that, that it can all be done through the company. Well, you know, it, it's hard to say. If now they actually switched, it, it switched hands. Now it's another oligarch. Now it's uh, Alisher Usmanov who co-owns it. So now it's sort of two Russian oligarchs running the show, right? So uh, it's very hard to say to which extent Kremlin is involved. What we know is that these guys are very close to authorities, right? But that's beyond the point. There is a lot of other action happening around live journal and the Russian internet, which I find particularly troubling and suspicious. And I think the fascinating case and the character, the most fascinating character in the story is a guy called Konstantin Rykov, who is a 29-year-old uh, new media entrepreneur who was on the Russian internet for probably the last 12 years, doing all sorts of interesting projects, a lot of them sort of counterculture, really cool alternative projects who by you know, 2007 became mainstream enough to get elected in elections for the Russian Duma. So now he is a member of the Russian parliament. 
his uh, key achievement was setting up a company called New Media Stars, and they actually call themselves that in English, so they don't have a Russian name, so it's New Media Stars, uh, which is basically a new media startup, a new media company, which is catering to a lot of Kremlin's needs. You know, I'm, I, I usually make that comparison that New Media Stars is to Kremlin's new media needs is what Halle Burton used to be for sort of, you know, Pentagon's and uh, Washington's, you know, war and, and all needs, because essentially it's a company which has created a host of projects. Uh, some of them are online news sites, which are pushing very strongly for pro-government view. Some of them are internet TV stations, and they actually essentially now have managed to create the most popular Russian internet TV station, which during the uh, war in South Ossetia, for example, was a key player in influencing the public opinion in Russia. So they, had, they ran a lot of anti-Georgian material with a lot of Russian extremists who would never be able to secure uh, time even on Russian you know, TV stations, you know, regular ones. And most uh, disturbingly, they also produce all sorts of viral internet videos. So they produced a documentary immediately following the Ossetian War. They produced a documentary supposedly shot from, uh, by the Georgian soldiers who were shooting their atrocities on a mobile phone. And then that mobile phone got confiscated and they turned it into a documentary, which got huge coverage in Russia. They put it everywhere on the internet. They encouraged everyone to pirate it. So the fact we don't care about copyright, just go ahead and share it everywhere you can. And they created even more buzz for it because the Ukrainian parliament had a large discussion and banned it in Ukraine and said they're not going to show it, which only added to the publicity for the movie. Okay. And the movie is a very clear uh, sort of material of propaganda arguing for one particular side, right? And it got, it may not have got so much traction offline. But on the internet, that was the thing. That sort of opened, it was supposed to open the eyes of those who were still not convinced uh, by the war to its reality. So, uh, you know, while we don't really see censorship per se, there is still a lot of undercover manipulation and control of the, you know, 50 cent party, uh, 50 cent party type that Rebecca right. described. By the way, I mean, I, some of the figures for the 50 cent party in China, th th there is an estimate that there are around 280,000 people in it. Right, or that sort yeah, of national, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's a huge entity there, and I assume that you know we see quite a lot of that in Russia. You know, I can talk more specifically about you know cyber attacks later on, which I find yeah. to be a new emerging tactic against uh, people who express dissent. But it sounds um, as though this strategy is really quite yeah. successful. That it that it avoids yeah. the appearance of, of yeah. censorship, yeah. which is something that, that troubles sure, the Chinese sure, government sure, because sure. it creates a kind of resistance and yeah. a suspicion yeah. of, of official yeah. media. Is there any kind of suspicion, mm -hmm. any resistance of that mm -hmm. rather sort of cheeky, mm -hmm. irreverent nature that mm -hmm. you see in China? Mm -hmm. in Russia? Well, I think Russians will never send out the web for one uh, simple reason. It helps them to contrast themselves to Chinese and mm. say, look, we're the good guys. So, you know, Medvedev made a few statements saying, actually, we are never going to censor the web. You know, so for them, censoring it even once will already spoil the whole sort of party. You know, now they sort of manage to stay inside of the West as a democratic uh, player, saying that our neighbors in China are all censoring the web, and look at us, we have free society where we don't have to do it. You know, so all your complaints about press freedoms are more or less ungrounded, because we don't even have to do it. But, but the, is there a sense amongst yeah. um, Russian web users yeah. that, that this is nevertheless not an unpolluted environment? Mm. Because mm. from what you say, clearly, it is very highly manipulated. Um, I think, uh, you know, some Russian users do understand that. I think a lot more and more of them become, uh, become very suspicious of what they did online. And I think that the ultimate tactic and the ultimate objective for uh, you know the governments and their affiliates, both in Russia and in China, to decrease the amount of trust that we place in what we read online. Because essentially, if you know that the government might be paying someone to comment on your blog and to comment on your story, you will automatically treat it with suspicion. You know, and 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 you know it, it may sound kind of strange for people who don't use the internet that much, you know, who don't use blogs that much. And people place so much trust in it, but this is true. I mean, all surveys in Russia, I don't know about China, but they reveal that the internet still remains the most trusted source of news for and Russians, right? So there is automatically a very <laughs> default mode of trust uh, towards what's online. But I think, you know, there have been a, a number of scandals recently and a number of revelations, for example, it was, it was revealed that 
now major Russian PR firms have made it a requirement for applicants who apply for positions to be able to come and show a portfolio of at least six virtual personas that they have created online. <laughs> You know, so you're supposed to come and show that those are six blogs which have been and six real bloggers which have been blogging for at least six months and they have real friends, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And that's now the benchmark for sort of successful work on the internet, right? So of course people are getting suspicious, <laughs> uh, but you know, what can you do? <laughs> I, the, I, we've seen uh, in recent years that that print media, for instance, yeah. in Russia, journalists have paid a very high price yeah. for, for saying things that, yeah. that uh, made them unpopular, <coughs> Politovskaya, mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. colleagues. Mm -hmm. What happens if somebody posts online mm -hmm. material of that kind, yeah. about Chechnya, for instance, sure. or something that really annoys the yeah. authorities? Yeah. What yeah. happens yeah. to them? Well, you see, the, 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 it, it's a very interesting question because, because Russia doesn't send to the web, we don't really see uh, what's happening to posts which we don't like. You know, because I, let, let me explain. If you're blocking, you know, WordPress.com or Blogger.com, you know, you kind of know that nothing potential is being created there. If you have established some tight control over live journal, and if somebody posts something critical, and within two hours they get a call from FSB and they're being asked to politely remove it, or they'll have trouble, you know, it's not a major media story because it doesn't get reported anywhere because it was online just for two hours. So, for example, some of the reports on the protest in Vladivostok about the uh, tariffs uh, that, you know, in the car, the big car scandal that was happening in Russia just a few uh, weeks ago, you know, in, in, in December. Uh, you know, the moderators of one particular community, uh, which united sort of, you know, auto lovers and people, you know, who are really deeply involved with the issue, they got messages asking them to politely remove all the reports about protests. So, you know, they were actually posting pictures and everything else. And then the problem is that, you know, this sort of undercover and underreported post factum censorship is much more dangerous than trying to filter the web uh, beforehand, right? Why? And, uh, because we don't see it. Uh, you know, so we, you know, when I say there is no censorship in Russia, there is no censorship where you would get a fancy picture of a policeman saying that you can't go to that website. Right, which you know, and Rebecca says that it's bad that they just show you, you know, a page cannot be displayed as opposed to, for example, Saudi Arabia, where they actually tell you that mm -hmm. this site has been blocked and you know, and and then they're actually very transparent. In Russia, you don't really know what has been published, what has not been published, what has been available, what has not been made available, because all of that happens privately. Right, you know, people who create content are being asked to remove it. So quietly. I sense that they're it's being, better for your health if you being, take yeah, it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, in, in that sense, and it's bad because there, there are no indexes, and it doesn't get into you know reporters without borders reports because it's not reporting anywhere, right? Uh, so we don't have that much of a good awareness of the okay. situation. Um, I want to ask um, both of you uh, whether the current economic downturn, crisis, however we put it, what impact do you think that's going to have? I know that in China there's a lot of concern mm -hmm. about social order, about all these issues that the Chinese government is always concerned about. Um, I've read that the first in the first month of this year there has been a bit of a purge on mm -hmm. the web, and uh, Russia's not doing too well either. Do you think mm. we're going to see this um, in how the authorities deal with the web in the, in the next year or two? Well, it's going to be a very challenging year in China, not only because of the economic downturn uh, and possible discontent created by that, which I think uh, on its own would be the first real test of how successful or unsuccessful Chinese internet censorship and controls really are. Because, you know, in, in times of prosperity, people are more likely to just kind of go along with things or be patriotic or be critical of the West and, and you know it's when things get really bad and they lose their jobs and they start feeling victimized locally that's that's when I think you'd see the real test so I, I think the Chinese government does realize that you know this is why they passed a big you know they, they un, un launched a big stimulus package um, to to try and make sure that cho college graduates are going to get some jobs and, and and try and deal with this but on top of that you have the 20th anniversary of the June 4th massacre coming up you have the 50th anniversary of the Dalai Lama's flight from Tibet coming up. Um, you have several other anniversaries, you know, the 10th anniversary of the, the Falun Gong uh, emergence yeah. on the scene. 
um, all kinds of, of, of political democracy anniversaries. Wall, yeah, democracy Wall, May 4th Movement, uh, and the 60th anniversary of the Communist Party. So, so politically, even without the economic problems, it was going to be a rough year that the authorities were clearly, you know, have been saying to people in web companies, you know, this is a critical year, you, you know, you're responsible for, you know, not messing up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you combine that with the economy, and it, it, it certainly is a real test. So we expect it to get tighter this year? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it would be in keeping with, I think, trends. I mean, as, as you mentioned, there was this anti-porn crackdown in January that was used in part as a cover to close down a, a bunch of pol political websites or, or, or websites that had political conversations on them. And even in sort of a normal cycle of a normal year, there are certain months that are politically sensitive. And you always see censorship tightening up during that, those months and then loosening down. And so given the nature of the sensitivity, we can certainly expect it to get quite tight in the coming months. You can. Well, in Russia, I mean, the mainstream media was under severe pressure, actually not even to use the word crisis for the first two or three months. So there was, you know, there was a lot of talk about an actual moratorium imposed on using the word crisis in, in the Russian media. Um, and, you know, it has, I think, uh, become a bit softer, so you do see references to the crisis in the mainstream media. The internet was more or less uh, full of discussions about the issue, and, you know, and I think we also have to realize that in Russia, because uh, Live Journal has emerged as this new public platform, could be because, you know, the mainstream media was, uh, you know, there was much tighter control over it or for some reason, but Live Journal has attracted a lot of very smart people. So now you have a lot of public intellectuals, uh, activists, journalists. It's a very smart crowd. You know, a lot of economists, all the major opposition leaders, well, you know, whatever the Russian opposition is, but all the major opposition leaders are online. Uh, so, uh, you know, and then government tolerates some of those discussions, in part because my feeling is that they themselves don't know what to do that well. And there is a lot of internal squabbling within Kremlin, within different factions. So so I think, you know, it may actually be <laughs> useful for them to read at least on some of those discussions. So uh, the online uh, world has actually been quite, uh, quite helpful here. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of economists in Russia also who block. So it didn't uh, spread that much. And then, then, you know, in Latvia, which is you know, not so far, what happened is that one of the internet commentators was actually arrested for making extremely dire predictions about the state of the Latvian economy. And there was a big campaign uh, around him. And the same happened in South Korea, where a blogger was arrested for uh, causing something up to 2 billion fluctuations in the Korean stock market, right? Because of his also very uh, pessimistic predictions about the internet. So I think it's a fascinating issue, and we are only beginning to see how the governments will react to what their people say online and how they establish the criteria for truthfulness <laughs> and how they, you know, decide what's gossip and what's a provocation. You know, and we see a lot of that happening here in the U.S. also, you know, where sure. there's a lot of speculation. Every time there is a speculation about the health of, you know, Steve Jobs, automatically Apple stock is it goes up or down. A lot of people make money on that, right? So I think we'll see soon a major discussion on, you know, what do we do about financial speculation online as well. Very good. Now it's your turn. And um, uh, we'll also be, thank you very much. There are some roving microphones, so we need to wait for those. And we'll also be checking in with our web audience. And uh, could we have, um, it would help if you could let us know who you are, if you feel like it. Pasha, down at the front. Um, yeah, we'll take we'll take a couple. So, just keep your hands up for a second. Okay. So, Isaac, this lady, and and then behind. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you again, for sharing so many informative you know, uh, insights about China and Russia. Actually, I think you know um, maybe some more words you know about the the censorship in China. Um, because uh, more and more creative, you know, ways that internet users uh, are using to try to uh, get across the censorship system, either in technical way or in social ways. Mm, but uh, I have also have some questions. You know, the censorship. You know, the the government learned a lot from people's uh, uh, transparency about 
how to make uh, conventions. So they improved the censorship system a lot as well to, to try to you know, uh, elaborate you know, the, the control uh, in different countries. So I think you know, the censorship has uh, got across the border of countries, all right. Maybe they share the knowledge as well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think they have improved the system a lot uh, for the past several years. So what's your maybe uh, ideas or maybe your insights about how the anti-censorship movement can get across, can, can cross the border as well to like the big two countries, you know, mm -hmm. can learn from each other, yeah, like that. Thank mm. you. And the lady at the end here. So much. I, I'm curious. Have they thought if they're having all of this trouble from this one place that was brought up yeah. from Southern California? Yeah. Have they thought of perhaps going to another online? Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. are there other are, are there other opportunities? Is there that chance? Would okay. that help? Um, okay. Well, I, actually, I think it was Tom and then the gentleman behind, and then we'll have a round another round soon. Okay. Uh, well, f uh, first I want to uh, congratulate the panel for, for the first time in OSI history mentioning uh, alpaca sheep and teenage girls <laughs> uh, in the same forum. So uh, kudos uh, this has on never that. never happened here? Uh, you'll never be asked back to OSI ever again. <laughs> um, the, my question is um, to, uh, for Rebecca. Uh, you know, you're talking about the ways in which humor, humor kind of sneaks in, and it's very difficult to censor. Uh, these kind of humorous things, in part because you do look a little ridiculous as a government actor, you know, sort of shutting down, uh, you know, the alpaca sheep things and some of the other stuff that you said. But uh, don't you agree that it's also hard to translate some of that humor, which is all well and good, into meaningful political action? Yeah. And so when you're sort of evaluating sort of freedom of expression on the internet and you're taking note of these humorous events, uh, you know, what's the real meaning there in, in terms of creating an open society uh, in China? Uh, how much weight do you give to those to those moments or those uh, incidents? Okay, Excellent so could you hand question. the microphone to the gentleman behind you there? Ted Perlmutter, New York University. Um, about six months ago, I heard of an interesting panel at NYU. I think John Zittrain was chairing it, in which he was talking about um, a sort of a high-powered group of folks, I think some of your former colleagues at the Berkman Center, trying to develop a set of norms that international companies could use in dealing with threats to censorship, and, or threats of censorship and demands for data and things like that. I was wondering if you had anything specific to say about this, which I think is now sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation, and whether you think norms is the way to go on this, or whether you think this is something in which there should be more legally binding political authority. That was a voluntary agreement, if I remember yeah, right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm one of the founding members of it, so yeah. I'm happy to comment on it. Are okay, mm -hmm. shall we, let's go, let's go with that? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, so, so this uh, agreement um, you mentioned is, is now known as the Global Network Initiative. Um, and basically what it is, it's a voluntary code of conduct for free speech, free expression and privacy for internet and telecommunications companies. And it was basically, uh, brought together like many corporate social responsibility initiatives in a number of different industries. So for instance, manufacturing, um, you know, sportswear ma manufacturing companies have gotten together and said, okay, we're going to set basic bottom line standards and come together in a multi-stakeholder ag agreement and agree to let human rights groups and other NGOs monitor what they do and benchmark them and so on. And so this is a similar initiative that really got started in 2006 after Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft were hauled into Congress and yelled at because Yahoo had handed over several people to the Chinese police um, who had been using the Yahoo.cn Chinese version of Yahoo, which was hosted on computer servers inside China. And the Chinese police had gone to Yahoo asking for user information. They'd handed it over. And Google had rolled out the censored search engine, which I showed a sample of. and and Microsoft had, had taken down content from Chinese bloggers and there was concern that Western companies were just rolling over and playing dead in order to, to um, do business. And the idea behind the initiative was uh, that, you know, how can, is it possible for companies to engage in markets where there are issues with the political system and issues with the legal system 
in, in a way that is not entirely compromising, you know, where they, they can draw bottom lines. And, and part of the problem is, is, is that I think globally, and, and this is a global initiative, by the way, it's not meant just to apply to companies operating in China and Vietnam and Russia. It's also meant to, op to apply when they're operating in Europe and the United States and Canada and wherever. It's supposed to be global. And people like myself who are part of the initiative are only going to remain in it if it remains global. But part of the issue is you have governments here. You have internet companies, you know, web services and telecommunications here in this layer between governments and citizens. And increasingly, basically, our entire communications, our understanding of the world, our personal relationships, our business relationships, everything is dependent on this layer. And so if this layer is not transparent, um, and, and if, it, if, if this layer has turned into an opaque arm of the powerful, that's a real problem. Then, then that enforces incumbent, it reinforces incumbent power anywhere, not, not just in authoritarian countries, but, but potentially in democratic societies as well. And, and so the, the goal, as, at least as I see it, I, I don't want to speak for other members of the initiative, but the, the goal of the initiative as I see it is to push the companies to be a neutral layer in between, you know, not saying that, okay, companies, you must commit uh, civil disobedience and turn into human rights groups. But to say, okay, if you know, we, we have an issue where pretty much in every country on earth, you have governments putting pressure on companies to do things that many of us would consider bad. And, and you have those things happening in the United States and Europe as well, you know, worse in China, but it's everywhere. And, and so to say, okay, you can only engage in, in countries where you're not going to have these pressures, basically then the bu business would never, you'd have no, no services. Um, so so in, in that case, um, because one of the criticisms from some human rights groups is, that, oh, this is just a fig leaf so that the companies can just continue to do their thing. Um, Sharon, Sharon Home is here, and she's with Human Rights in China, and, and she, she's involved with the initiative as well, and this is a multi-stakeholder thing, and we are only in it to the extent that we think it's going to be real. And the moment it ceases to be real, uh, some of the stakeholders will pull out. And, and so it's in very early stages in that Basically, the thing just launched. They launched the principles um, in the late fall, and a, an entire mechanism for how the companies are going to be benchmarked, how they are going to conduct conduct human rights feasibility assessments when they roll out new products. There, there, there's a whole set of requirements that they're going to be expected to be to adhere to and 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 be subjected to reporting requirements and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, I, I, I'm not aware um, that it's getting any foundation funding at this point. The, the, the corporate participants, when they join, are asked to contribute. Um, and as far as other funding, that's still being sorted out. Um, and they're looking for a lot more companies to join. But just, it just it's sort of a factual thing there. But that's, that's the status on it. I won't go on. Okay. Um, should I so talk about some of the other ones, or do, you, do we want to go to Why don't we, and then yeah. and why, why not another platform? Was the yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll take that one and also Isaac's yeah. briefly. Uh, the problem is moving to a different platform is that a lot of the communities on LiveJournal are very well formed and well established, and they have their own practices and norms, and they have their own sort of, you know, institutional flavor, so to say. And it's very hard to reconstruct them if, you know, one quarter of a community goes to one service and then another quarter moves elsewhere. There have been attempts to organize, you know, uh, to, to have organized migration, so to say. You know, so people decided <laughs> to move in bulk, actually, you know, so 10% or, you know, 5% would try. The thing is that they would all come back because 95% would still stay because they don't care about the fact that the Kremlin is watching them, right? So essentially, uh, you know, it, it, it just didn't work out that way. So now everyone is still tied to that one particular platform. Uh, and to very briefly address, uh, you know, Isaac's question, um, you know, uh, it's a very good point that the authoritarian governments have, have actually learned quite a bit in the last two or three years, you know, and I think there was a lot of talk that they actually share some of the knowledge and some of the technologies with each other, that, you know, that the Chinese are exporting their technology somewhere. It hasn't been proved, 
But I think what we do see is a traffic of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so some of the technologies originating in Russia are slowly, you know, moving to Belarus, or some of the technologies originating in China are slowly moving, you know, to its other neighbors. What I find particularly troubling, for example, is that in Saudi Arabia, for example, for five, for six years, there was always a service which allowed people to nominate sites for uh, censorship, you know, so if you didn't, if you found one particular site offensive, you could go and nominate it, you know, and it would be, uh, you know, censored. Now the <laughs> same, uh, the sa uh, you, you know, you're laughing, but just last week, there was the same platform launched in Thailand. So now there is a site called protectthekink.com where you can actually go and suggest a site which you think is offensive to the king of the royal family. And, you know, and in the first 24 hours, more than 5,000 sites were blocked. Uh, you know, so it's a pretty good numbers, uh, you know, and then this sort of I inspirational presence of the Chinese or the Russian centers, I think is very uh, dangerous but for, uh, yeah. So can you see, as I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether, yeah, there was, there was, there was the a comment, more. yeah, I'll, 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 sure. The, the resistance, as it yeah. were, can internationalize. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I think there are a few things to do. Of course, we should go and sort of develop the uh, tools, like Tor, of whom we have two, two members and representatives here who can say a few words, which help you to bypass a lot of this uh, filtering restriction, right? What I think is even more important is to realize that a lot of the actions taken on issues like internet filtering by the Western governments only add additional uh, legitimacy to the actions taken by the Chinese or the Russian governments. You know, so when you have the Australian or the British government saying that they want to crack down on pornography online, you know, and are actively debating legislature actually to do it, you know, you start asking yourself, if the Chinese and the Russians start asking themselves, well, if they can, why can't we do it? You know, so, you know, I think we have to be very careful uh, about what we are doing here in the West and how it actually uh, is being used as an excuse elsewhere, you know, be it China, be it elsewhere. So, you know, it may be worthwhile to actually put more pressure on the Western governments and to make sure that they are actually cognizant of all the repercussions the actions will have, you know, in authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to, to, to add to that, I mean, I think one thing we are finding that certainly building better circumvention, uh, circumvention tools as uh, Roger and Andrew who, who build Tor are doing is very important. But a lot of, a lot of these problems are also social in, in that um, a, a lot of Chinese people might even know about circumvention tools but aren't using them because they, they don't think it's worth the bother to access the content on the other side or their friends aren't there and so on. And, and, and so how do you kind of create social support networks that, that make people more inclined to spread alternative forms of information and to think critically? And of course, Isaac is very much involved with this idea that you, know, you can't have free speech without free thinking. And, and in efforts to, to really just help facilitate loose networks, social networks of people who tend to be liberal free thinkers, um, just, just to have conversations with, with one another, not to drive a specific agenda, but just to, to be able to have a discourse. Um, and and I, I do think that efforts that are made to help facilitate spaces, help create spaces where people can have an unmanipulated discourse are, are very important. And so I know you're working, uh, Isaac's working on something called Digital Nomads, which is helping a, a nonprofit to help people set up blogs that will not be censored, and there, there are a number of other projects. But those technically, technical solutions won't work unless there's also kind of a su social support group around it. And not just country to country, but I think, I think internationally, people who care about these issues um, need help kind of sort of sharing strategy with one another and, and sharing knowledge and sharing awareness and, and, and also to, to speak mm. to your point, it's not, I, I think a lot of people in China and in mm. Russia get offended when kind of Westerners say, hi, we wanna come help save you. You know, how can we help? And, 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 and they get the middle finger from, from, from people in, in China and Russia. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, you know, there, there, there are, Obviously, there, there, there's a real matter of degree about the concerns, but there are people around the world in, who are concerned about free expression and either its protection or its achievement in their societies. And how do you create 
a, a citizens movement globally that's kind of pushing back on companies because you've got a huge weight on of governments on web services and companies you don't have a lot of citizen awareness of what's going on in that layer and how the government and and that layer are communicating how do you create greater public awareness so that there'd be more pressure uh, from the grassroots, from civil society, on politicians, not to agree to stupid things uh, like like Australia's plan mm -hmm. to filter their internet, mm -hmm. which is being discussed now, yeah. and it, you know things things like that um, that is very untransparent, very unaccountable, could easily mission creep uh, into something mm -hmm. else without anybody really noticing. Um, you know how how do you create a more effective citizen movement, but also just public awareness and education. You know, I, I've been teaching in a university in Hong Kong for the last two years. Hong Kong doesn't censor its internet, but my students have absolutely no idea about uh, the privacy levels of their email or not, or, uh, you know, and any of these issues related to the web services they use, the technologies they use, and the free expression of privacy implications, they know nothing. And, and unless citizens are better informed and educated about what's going on or what's going on with internet governments, the governance, what's going on with decisions that are being made by technology companies and regulators about standards in terms of identity, the next layer of identity on the web and so on, if citizens just aren't paying any attention to this, um, then, then the people who are creating these standards have much less incentive to really worry about what the citizens think. And, and so I think if journalists, educators, civil society need to do a much, much bigger job of, of raising public awareness. I, I know, Tom, you asked a question that has not been addressed by anybody, so I better address it. I think you're absolutely right about this issue of, you know, the protest gets all driven to the humor, and, and do, can it actually lead to meaningful action? And this is the thing, is, is that um, there's, there's a, a Chinese scholar at the University of Nottingham named Yung Nian Zheng, uh, Zheng Yongnian, who, who wrote a book recently where he talked about something called authoritarian deliberation. And that China as an authoritarian society has actually become quite deliberative in that the internet has enabled a huge space for people to actually have quite a lot of conversations and trade a lot of jokes and you know talk about all kinds of things as long as they don't cross a certain line. Um, yet, and so people feel like, you know, if I'm angry about something, I can make a funny vid video and make fun of the leadership, you know. There are all these things I can do that will impress my friends and occupy my time and I don't have to go on the street. Um, and, and democratic institutions have not advanced at all, the legal system hasn't changed at all, but people are feeling like they have a lot more ability, you know, are feeling freer than they did before. And, but this is where yeah. the economy might be right. an interesting yeah. test. Yeah. Although so, the first, the first yeah. attempt to prosecute someone for being mm -hmm. funny on the web was actually a private citizen, Chen Kai Ge, mm -hmm. the filmmaker, mm -hmm. taking a, a, and he a did man that on to court. Copyright grounds. Indeed. But, but it was really because he was being laughed at. Right, right. <laughs> but, but yeah, a, a guy spoofed his film and, right. and he sued on copyright grounds. But I think, you know, Tom, yeah. your point applies not only to, to, to China, you know, it applies to many other countries where, you know, and, and to many other, you know, internets, because we are not really, I'm not even sure that it's so much about humor. A lot of this is about cynicism. Mm -hmm. You know, and this produces a very cynical attitude towards, you know, engagement in politics, uh, you know, among young people and others. You know, I have, have a piece in The Economist this week on cyber hedonism, which I think, you know, is the very nice description of, uh, you know, what's happening. Because a lot of these young people and, you know, and older people, of course, as well, you know, I'm just not sure that, you know, they are getting as involved in traditional politics and traditional sort of civil society matters because of the web, where, you know, you feel like by, you know, by, fi by thinking that, you know, you post a video which is funny and humorous and cynical, you sort of, you do your job as a citizen, I think it's a bit of a, you know, of a stretch. Oh, okay, <laughs> I wanted to, just to check on the web how our, uh, how our questions are coming in from, I Yes, there's actually a very active conversation going on in the background. So We're you think this is the conversation, but actually there's you know <laughs> another 30 people out there who are um, who are actively going at it and providing us with links and commentary and debating whether or not what you've said is true and not true. <laughs> um, so we have a couple. I'll throw out a, a three or four sure. questions that have come from the web. Uh, this is from Kathy Fitzpatrick. The question is: Do anonymizers help Chinese internet users evade the censors? Or does the use of such techniques themselves draw more scrutiny? I think it's a technical question that would be very helpful here. 
Um, also, a quick question about whether censorship within China about issues, if Rebecca, if you could address issues specifically related to, related to Tibet and mm -hmm. Xinjiang. Um, Xinjiang. Xinjiang, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, comments to the effect that, uh, from Jillian York, that Russia does in fact block some websites, and I wonder, if Evgeny, whether you could address that, because there, is, there certainly is evidence that they do, they do block to some degree. And then a last question. Um, have, uh, also for Yevgeny, have bloggers and readers uh, developed any way to recognize who are authentic commenters and not the government sock puppets deliberately yeah. posting to control discourse? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. We need to question. keep the answers fairly short. You want to yeah. answer yeah. that start. last question? Um, on, you know, I'll just start with Russia and, and you know, what blocking the Sanders. I mean, I think the only very credible body of material and evidence that we have is a study by the Open Net Initiative, right? And they haven't, which is a consortium of four universities which have been tracking web filtering and web censorship around the world. They haven't found uh, any major censorship in Russia. You know, and again, that depends on what we mean by, by major. I haven't seen any URLs in that report for Russia as we're present for you know, China and many other countries. Uh, it is true that often, you know, sites which incite hatred or extremism, you know, which sort of violate Russian law, they would not be blocked. The owners would just be either invited to court, you know, or would be otherwise pressured uh, by, by legal means. You know, it's, uh, they're breaking Russian law and there is pressure against them. I haven't seen that applied with probably one exception uh, for political speech. So, you know, last year, or I think it was maybe two years ago, there was a Russian blogger who literally said that the police should be burned for whatever they've done to him. And that triggered uh, a big court case, and he was, uh, I think, actually in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the uh, excuse, you know, or <laughs> the clothes used was that it was an incitement to, to violence. Uh, so, uh, in this case, it's yes, we can say that there is something going on. Again, I wouldn't really qualify it as the political censorship that exists in China. With regards to the last question, have bloggers developed any tools or means of recognizing uh, genuine content from fake one? Uh, uh, you know, y yes, because a lot of that content is anonymous. Uh, you know, and, and of course, if you already know and follow 20 or 50 people online and you do that regularly, of course you know the reputations. And of course, you know what they normally blog about, and you know their political or social stance. So of course, when suddenly somebody anonymous starts posting who, and of course, I should remind you that both in the case of Russia and in the case of China, it's very common for these paid internet commentators to open blogs with no posts, where they just don't do anything. They just register a blog just to sort of use it as an excuse that they are a blogger to be able to comment on a particular service. So you know, of course, people know how to check. So you can go and verify whether this person is real, whether that person you know, has a po long history of blogging or not. The problem is that a lot of people who do have something to say, who are human rights activists or others, would love to be anonymous as well. You know, anonymity is not necessarily bad online, particularly you know, in China, for example, right? So many people would actually love to be anonymous. So it, it's still very dangerous to sort of figure out, you know, can you actually trust the fact that they have no previous history online mm. and stuff like that. So, There's but no I haven't proof. seen, yeah, I haven't seen any specific tools which do that. There is a plenty of interesting concepts here in the US which help you identify you know, liberal or conservative bias in the media. Plenty of very interesting online tools as well. You know, it would be very interesting to see some of those concepts and tools apply to identify mm. pro-government and anti-government spin in, you know, in, in Russia or China. I just think it would be uh, difficult for just linguistic purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So to go to the two questions, one about use of anonymizers and whether the use of those tools gets people in trouble, I think, was basically the question. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I haven't, I don't know of any cases of, of anybody in China who has been arrested or, or gotten in trouble specifically because or only because they were using either an anonymizing tool or a circumvention tool to get around or, or using encryption, which, which would encrypt their email or something. Um, however, 
people are some, there are some people who are worried that that would be the case. And also, the use of those tools does draw attention, can draw attention to you. So particularly using, for instance, PGP encryption on your email, that a lot of people, actually a lot of human rights activists, advise people not to use it um, because it's sort of a flag saying, I'm up to something, I've I have got secrets. A secret, yeah. I've got a secret. <laughs> um, and, and so one thing I have heard is that people who are already persons of interest, you know, who are, the police are already kind of paying attention to for some, re for some other reason, if the police see then, oh, this person is using Tor all the time, or this person is using PGP all the time, or this person is using Freegate or something all the time, then they will kind of see that as, they will put that down as in their list of reasons why they think this person is up to something. But, but it's not that you would get charged because you were using a tool in particular. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's kind of, the, the, but, but uh, yeah, there are, you know, millions of people who use these tools every day who are not fearful and are not getting in trouble for using them. And so that's also very important to point out. Okay, I um, know there are a lot more questions yeah. in the room. Could, mm -hmm. you, could you maybe very briefly sure. do Xinjiang and Xinjiang and Tibet, yeah. Uh, well, last year, uh, during the uh, disturbance in Tibet and then the aftermath of the discussion, uh, blog posts uh, and, and chat in the forums and so on advocating pro-Dalai Lama positions pro or pro-Tibet independence positions, which are not the same thing as Dalai Lama positions, actually, um, but all of those positions that were not PRC positions were getting censored. But there was a lot of discussion on the Chinese internet about Tibet from the Chinese point of view. So it wasn't that you couldn't say anything about Tibet, it was just that the space was filled with information that went in the government's favor. So that's an example of a somewhat more sophisticated strategy rather than preventing people from talking about it at all. Um, Xinjiang, again, it, it's sort of similar. If you're trying to talk about Xinjiang, you know, Uyghur independence or, 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 or religious issues, um, there's actually a clause in most user agreements in Chinese chat forums and blog hosting service saying, you know, I agree not to incite conflict amongst the, the, the different nationalities. And, and so, and anything that's kind of talking about ethnic conflict um, tends to get deleted sort of on, on that reason. Um, so, so yeah, it, it is certainly something that's quite sensitive. There was also the case of Wursa having a Chinese flag planted on, this is a Tibetan mm -hmm. writer who has a very moderate blog, but mm -hmm. not uh, an official party line blog. Mm -hmm. Who, uh, whose uh, blog was hacked and a yeah. Chinese flag was planted on it. Yeah, 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 there, there were several So people. there were several cases yeah. of attack. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, cyber attacks kind of yeah, uh, similar to what, what happens uh, in, in Russia. Yeah. So yeah. cyber bullying of all mm -hmm. kinds. This side of the room has not had enough attention. Uh, do we have a microphone, um, please? Microphones, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, we st there are two ladies there and then there are there's a lady behind and a gentleman behind. Okay, I have two questions. Um, Go two questions. Yeah, so questions. Well, my first question uh, is uh, whether we can consider the Internet as an um, influential source of information in Russia, given that the number of the regular users is pretty low, and according to some sources, it's just about 20%. Uh, and the second question is about the um, FSB involvement yeah. in the manipulating of the content of online discussions in Russia. Since according to one uh, of the reports uh, on the um, Russian government control over the internet, uh, the members of the Russian security service FSB make up 70% uh, of uh, the participants in online discussions. Do you have any findings about it? Okay. Uh, we're we're going to take a, a a bunch because we're getting short on time. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Sarah. I'm a researcher at Freedom House, and we're doing a project actually on looking at a lot of these issues. Um, I guess my question is looking ahead a few years, especially because you both mentioned there have been some changes. I mean, some of the vlogging phenomenon has really only taken off in the like four or five last four or five years. I guess looking ahead, say five years down the road, where do you see it developing? I guess particularly in China and Russia both on the technological level, especially with regard to, say, political mobilization and just how it might play out, but also, I guess, the intersection between the use of the internet and kind of more old-fashioned tools, 
And one thing that you see happening in China is you see people who are downloading sensitive information, maybe about Tibet or about Falun Gong, turning it into print underground leaflets and distributing that. Right. In some cases, that may be more effective in countering censorship. So that's kind of my question. Thank you Five years much. down the road, what Terrific. will happen? <gasps> Thank you. Uh, there's a lady behind. This question is for Rebecca. Uh, I was wondering, um, with the advent of things like Facebook, for example, what the Chinese government's um, stance on uh, Facebook would be um, and how users in China may use that to possibly get information, even though it's a social networking platform, how they would um, use information uh, in that respect. The other thing is, what is the um, penalty for uh, private entities who um, you know, for some reason allow uh, content that's restricted to get through, being that the onus is on them to make sure that, you know, this, this content doesn't um, stay up for very long. What sort of penalties does, does the government exact on those private entities for Thank um, you very violations? much. And the last one is just behind you. Hi, my name is Mark Belinsky from Digital Democracy. Um, I'm curious about the current sophistications on both sides. Uh, on the citizen side, um, whether they're using uh, coding um, or posting articles as pictures so that the words can't be tracked, um, and what the sophistication is on the government side to actually be able to find these and remove these effectively, or in the case of um, your experiment with posting on the, uh, the blogs, um, if you type in Tiananmen Square, are they tracking your IP address? Are they able to then pinpoint your location? And then the second question is, I think that um, mobile phones are currently emerging as players in the game as well, and I'm curious in these circumstances whether you see uh, mobile phones as, as emerging in these uh, two countries as, as powerful players and if people are being uh, geolocated um, and other implications from mobile phones. Thank you. You can okay. you start off. I'll, yeah, I'll start with the questions on, on Russia. I mean, it's true that you know, the internet penetration may not be as high, particularly outside of the major cities in Russia. However, uh, you know, I would say that <laughs> the major cities are pretty much well wired, and those are also the ones which are probably <laughs> most likely to express any dissenting attitudes, right? So Moscow is pretty much, I would say, you know, 90 or 80 percent online, right? So a lot of public life still happens, right? And I think a lot of uh, activism happens as well. So you know, you, you know, and the fact that in uh, Vladivostok you got so much action going on around those protests, and so much action actually did manage to appear online, to me, I think signifies that you know this action would not only be restricted to, to you know Moscow and Petersburg. So I don't really see it as a major hindrance. Of course, there are problems with uh, the internet connection, which may not be fast or reliable. And I think that partly answers, uh, you know, another question about, you know, the use of various tools and CDs and USB sticks to distribute content. Of course, it's happening, and you know, and that happened, in you know, in the last presidential elections in Belarus in 2006, for example, a lot of very nice anti-government digital content was produced and distributed on the internet, but then, since it was then only in the capital that people had a fast connection, it was burned on CDs, it was actually dropped in you know, postal boxes in, in, in the provinces, mm -hmm. right? So that definitely is happening, and I think that you know, there is a very nice bridge between this online and offline world, because you know, we may be only, it may only be 20% online, but it's probably something like 50% or 80% who have access to a computer. Right, or mobile phone for that matter, which will be more and more increasing. With regards to sort of the secret services the involvement to the internet, you know, I, it's very hard to say since this data is not public. Of course, there have been reports that you know they even have a special division, which whose only responsibility is just to go and leave comments on sites. You know, akin to the 50 cent party in China. What I'd like to mention very briefly is that I see a lot of very interesting sophistication in how they're trying to suppress free speech, particularly relying on cyber attacks. I'm not making any connection between FSB and cyber attacks, so Kremlin and cyber attacks for that matter. I'm just stating that there is a very interesting uh, trend going on, and I'll give you just very one short brief example of a very interesting and popular Georgian blogger who was blogging on Live Journal and who was very critical of actually both governments and how they handled the war. And you know, of course, he wasn't liked by many Russians. And he wasn't liked by many Russian bloggers. And at some point, a few months ago, uh, he was systematically under a cyber attack. So his blog was severely, 
you know, attacked, you know, for days. And the attack became actually so severe that the entire live journal was down for like three or five hours. So if you had an account on live journal you couldn't block, that of course pissed off many more people, right? Who just thought, you know, who is this Georgian guy? Why is he, you know, preventing me from accessing my own blog? So live journal couldn't do anything but actually delete this poor guy uh, because that was the only way for temporarily delete this poor guy. And it was the only way for them to actually stop the attacks. So he had to move to a different platform and to WordPress and cyber attacks followed him there, you know, so he became the di digital refugee, you know, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, and I think it's uh, methods like this, which are, you know, we, we don't see them reported in the media because they don't really count as censorship. It's not like, again, you know, accessing, uh, restricting access to a website, you know, so this is not being reported and we tend not to see them, but there are many more sophisticated tactics which are being used and who's behind them, you know, it's hard to say. I think I'll stop here, I might come yeah, back. Yeah, I think yeah. we have, yeah. Three minutes. Um, well, quickly then, I'll, I'll, I'll start by asking the, the question that is easiest to answer, which was, which was yours, about what is the penalty for, for companies that are not adequately policing their users' content. They can lose their business license. And so actually there was a video sharing site, one of the Chinese YouTube clones, um, that actually was shut down for a bit last year while they upgraded their t technology to control their content adequately because th they were just kind of in trouble. Uh, and the State Council Information Office, which is the main government body that is basically tracking how these, these web companies are doing, they actually give grades and scores to all these web companies. If, you're, if your grade goes below a certain level, you're going to be named and shamed and, and you, you may be put out of business. So, so, so it's it's very direct. You know, your your company's actual survival. Um, and uh, you were asking about Facebook. Um, chi China does not block Facebook entirely, although there are certain pages of it that are blocked. But most Chinese uh, internet users are on Chinese versions of Facebook, and all of those companies are a lot are required to censor in in all the ways I've described. And part of the reason is that the international Facebook just it isn't all in Chinese, and the interface just isn't what Chinese users want to use, and so they're all in the Chinese version. So, at the, but Facebook has not decided to create a censored Chinese version of Facebook for the Chinese market, which they could have done, um, and they they decided not to do, to their credit, probably. Um, because I imagine all these companies do end up having to go through that conversation of do we go in that direction or not. Um, question about mobile and trends and so on. Um, certainly mobile is the future. I mean, already in Japan and Korea, young people access the web more on their f phones than they do on, on, their, on their PCs. And China is now rolling out 3G. Uh, and so we can certainly see uptake in, in mobile web use. Um, even with SMS, you know, text messaging on just plain old GSM phones, however, that, th that's filtered. You know, I know somebody who tried to send a political joke on their phone and it got <laughs> blocked. So, so th th there are limits to, you know, the possibilities for people power movements being organized by yeah. cell phones in, in China. Yeah, yeah. And, and with 3G, you know, that's, that's going to be sort of an expensive elite yeah. thing. Um, it's going to be a long time before, and, and the government's not so worried about what the international business elites can access. And like, for instance, if you access the web on China from your BlackBerry t today, it's, you can access Human Rights Watch. But the government doesn't really care because there's just not enough critical mass of people trying to access Human Rights Watch on their Blackberries to, to, to really matter. <laughs> now, now, maybe Mass that'll change. Mass distribution of Blackberries. Maybe that'll change. You know, partially it has to do with pricing. It has to do with regulatory structures. And then there are other, you know, talking about the future, there are all kinds of issues about technical standards. You know, is, is, is an identity layer going to be built in that m eventually makes it impossible for people to be anonymous? Um, and how are those standards going to evolve on the mobile web? And it will, be as, will it be as open and possible for people to create their own tools, open source tools, on the mobile web as, as they can do on the, you know, the PC 
device based internet there are all these questions that you know have a lot to do with technical standards and again companies and governments getting together and deciding you know how all of this fits together technically and citizens really have no clue but you wanted yeah. to say I that just a very short yeah. comment yeah. On, on mobiles I mean it's true that there is a huge potential particularly for mobilization for around specific events so of course if there are elections coming up right you do want to organize a mass text messaging campaign to tell people you should come and organize in this particular part of town mm -hmm. on this square what also happens is that you know governments also manage to contact those companies and ask them to politely turn off tax messaging on that particular day yeah. or on that particular hour on that particular geographic area you know that happened in Belarus for example again during the last presidential elections mm -hmm. where you know when everyone gathered in the square to sort of try to you know reignite the orange revolution you know but in Belarus tax messaging was gone from that square you know mobile coverage was gone so there was no way for people to even use those tools to get in touch so you know and again I think we have to distinguish here between mobilization and information of course it may be get, it may be possible to get informed on a regular basis but this strategic use of text messaging for technology for protest mm -hmm. I think would still be under some control particularly in countries where governments have a major stake and uh, in uh, mobile networks which happens to be the case in most authoritarian countries I think yeah. And uh, as, as she was pointing out, too, the connection between yeah. offline and online. Yeah. And, and that's where, with political change, that's where the rubber really hits the road. It's, mm -hmm. it's where that interaction is between the online and the off. And that's exactly where mm -hmm. the Chinese government is really focusing, what kinds of online activities are leading to mm -hmm. offline offline action and those are the ones that get the greatest focus in terms of censorship and surveillance by the way with with mobile surveillance that's been possible from the beginning of mobile phones as long as you have the battery in your mobile phone not even turned on a cheap 1990s mobile phone you can be tracked um, and th that's been the case for forever um, so yeah it's uh, yeah, sort of defi definitely watching that watching you <laughs> <laughs> um, very briefly uh, uh, to add to what you just said about the capacity is that the Siemens platform that was sold yeah. to China is really important because it takes all of the databases and its data integration. So like well, everything is, is linked now with total to search capacity. Yeah. yeah, well th there's several points to me because there was also a, a question earlier about exporting of technology and, and so on. Is that actually the cases that on which we have proof of export of censorship te technology are not from China to other authoritarian countries but from the United <laughs> States and Western Europe to authoritarian countries yep. and and so Siemens has has been selling and and in quite a number of other countries in the run-up to the Olympics were selling all kinds of you know upgrading you know database you know police systems technology and so on um, but um, you know Cisco router and its and 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 its capacity to filter that came from Cisco that didn't come from the Chinese now one can debate whether it, whether you know it, it was really their fault that it got used for censorship and whatever but um, and different people have different views on that but also the primary tools that are used to censor the internet in in the Middle East are WebSense and smart filter among others mm -hmm. and those are made in the USA and um, so so the problem starts at home and, and until we take responsibility for our own exports, <laughs> um, it, you know, it's it's not surprising that quite a lot of people point to us and, and say, "You guys are kind of hypocritical." Thank you very much. I'm sorry to say we're billed to run to 7:30, and we're at our deadline. However, I'm sure that um, Rebecca and Evgeny will be around for a few yeah. minutes. She said, tossing them randomly to the crowd. Um, and uh, conversations will doubtless continue. Um, so I just, I, I think it's been a very rich discussion, too rich to sum up, except send your blackberries to China <laughs> and, <laughs> and watch out for those alpaca. Um, it, it removes the batteries before you do it. Remove the batteries <laughs> before you do it. If you see an alpaca with a blackberry, you know that the, the citizen's <laughs> revolution is really underway. There's another mashup we can make. <laughs> so thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And please thank our star panelists.